I'm Brady Berserker. I'm Big Sexy Brian Bales. And I'm Metal Matson from Super Geeky Playdate. A podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready because geekiness begins in... Three, two, one... Hey everybody, welcome back to The Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, David Dawson, and I'm extremely pleased to bring you this latest episode of the show. Whitney and I had the opportunity to sit down with Mark Christopher Lawrence, a very talented actor and comedian who happened to star on one of my all-time favorite uh, television comedies, the television series Chuck. And uh, he played Big Mike on Chuck. He was the owner of, or not the owner, he was the uh, manager of the Buy More, uh, which was the uh, the electronic store that the lead character Chuck uh, used as his cover story uh, to hide his spy life. And uh, Mark Christopher Lawrence was just hilarious on that show, and uh, I enjoyed him all five seasons that he was on that program on NBC. And um, you know, uh, the wonders of Facebook and a really tight-knit local community of uh, entertainers here in San Diego um, managed to bring the two of us uh, into similar orbits, and um, we got this fantastic uh, opportunity to sit down with Mark Christopher Lawrence and talk to him about his career, uh, his background, and uh, the things that he's up to today, and he opens up a bit about uh, his time on the the TV series Chuck and uh, kind of how things uh, functioned on that show in a really uh, kind of eye-opening way to kind of see how uh, kind of combating studio interests can kind of work against a show even when the show's a hit. Um, so it's a fascinating interview um, and uh, he's just a really great guy and uh, I'm so honored that uh, he took the time to sit down and chat with us. Um, it was really fantastic and after you've taken a listen to our interview with Mark, I strongly suggest that you go to vidangel.com and check out his uh, stand-up special that you can get there. It's only like 99 cents. Uh, I think you can even watch it for free if you do the free trial at vidangel. And uh, it's vidangel.com, and uh, you'd be looking for Mark Christopher Lawrence, clean out of Compton. And uh, we even talk a little bit about uh, him growing up in Compton in the interview, so uh, you get a whole bunch of background, and uh, it's fantastic. Also, uh, if you're looking for new things to uh, listen to, if you're looking for new podcasts to check out, uh, I highly recommend that you go to the Gunna Geek Network, of which The Intellectual is a proud part of, at gunnageek.com. And while you're there, you might want to check out the Game Life Balance podcast. And Game Life Balance is a lifestyle podcast it's hosted by Cody Goff and Jonathan Martin, two longtime frenemies who are trying to juggle their gaming hobbies with the increasing demands of adult life. Every other week, they review a retro game from the SNES Classic Mini and have surprisingly thoughtful discussions on how modern games and older games play different roles in adult life. You can check out Game Life Balance live at Gunna Geek on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. If you haven't checked out the Intellectual Podcast website, make sure you visit us at ixe.us. You can take a look at all of our back catalog of episodes there, as well as uh, links to our short films and various things that we uh, do on YouTube. Um, the hub of intellectual entertainment is ixe.us, so be sure to go and check that out. And uh, if you get a chance, drop us a note, say hi, let us know what sort of things you'd like to see us cover on the Intellectual Podcast. If you have suggestions from guests or topics that we could cover we'd love to hear from you and now we're going to get into one of my favorite episodes of the intellectual podcast our interview with mark christopher lawrence Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The intellectual podcast starts now. So we'll just launch right into this since uh, you got places to get to today. Well, it's a decent drive up to Victorville. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just meeting, meeting the other comments on the show, and so we're gonna 
I'm going to sleep while they drive. <laughs> That's nice. Carpooling and napping. Carpooling is yeah. a good idea. So, um, first of all, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting Ooh, with us. Man. Like, it, as a huge Chuck fan myself, like, it's a big deal to be sitting at the table with Big Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Not a big deal. I put my pants on just like you. I lay on the bed and hope I can button them. <laughs> you do put your pants on just like me. <laughs> big brothers unite. Um, so just uh, let, let, let's just get into it a little bit. So you've got a comedy special out right now. Yeah. Uh, clean Out of Compton? Yeah, Clean Out of Compton. Marcus wants Clean Out of Compton. It's a dry bar comedy special. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you were saying before we started ch- chatting that you, you've kind of always done stand up and acting both. Yeah. How, how'd you get into both of them? Well, here's, here's what happened. I, um, you know, I grew up in Compton during the height of the rise of the Bloods and Crips. And, you know, it was, it was in fact, I saw Compton um, change from when we first moved there in 1969. We were the second black family on our street. And wow. by 1974, all the white families had moved out. The gangs had started moving in. And um, just like you put a frog in water and you turn the, turn the pot on and slowly bring the water up to boil, the frog would just sit there because he, he doesn't realize that his environment is changing. And so uh, as I grew up in that environment, it slowly changed over the years and realized how rough it was. Mm. You know, so it was OK. But then by the time I got to junior high school, I knew that there was this 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 group of kids that I was hanging out with that a lot of them weren't going to make it, uh, that, you know, just because of the things that they were doing. And then when I got to high school, uh, I ran into my English teacher, Mrs. Schilling, who I say changed my life. Um, what she did was uh, she got me involved in speech and debate and she put me in the first play that I'd ever been in. And all of a sudden, I didn't have time to hang out on the weekends or after school, or, you know, after football practice was over. I, I was working on speeches and going to tournaments. Wow. So that was a direct connect to uh, a guy named Perry Brent, who um, sort of mentored me a little bit and uh, sort of put, planted a seed of stand up. And then my best friend, Lennon Trotter, uh, said, look, let's go to the comedy store and do three minutes. And so we did that and I was funny and I didn't really have an act, but, you know, Perry sort of helped shape the way I do comedy. And um, so that was the beginning of comedy and acting, really. Um, I went to USC on a debate scholarship, which which I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And um, I took a a speech class uh, for centering and, and, you know, and the, the instructor said, well, you can't pass the class unless you do two monologues and two songs. So I did that. And then he talked me into auditioning for the acting program at USC, the BFA acting program. I was already a junior. And I got in and um, started working professionally the same year. Okay. So you had to do two songs? Two songs and two monologues, yeah. So were you musically inclined? Uh, I, I can sing. I'm not a singer. I, 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 I always say, I have a friend up in Napa who plays piano and he, he, he says, you are a singer, but I'm not. <laughs> it's like, it's like for years I didn't go like audition for a musical because I'd get there and I'd, I'd hear somebody sing and go, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I just turn around and, and go home, tell my agent it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not for lack of ability, it's just not a comfort zone. Well, it's just, it's just, you, you know, you hear somebody who's truly gifted as a singer and it makes you go, wow, I am not a singer. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I can carry, I can hold a note, but you know, I'm not, I'm not like one of those people who is just amazing mm-hmm. to hear, you know? Um, so I do sing, like I sing in my act a little bit too. Yeah. So when you started doing comedy, mm-hmm. like you said, you went and just did three minutes and found you were funny. Right. How did you approach becoming a comedian? Did, did you pull from that experience being the frog? In Compton, or were you making jokes up? No, I, I was making jokes up because I didn't. I didn't know how to be a comic. I didn't know what that was. You know, really. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I see people that I liked, but I, I didn't know how to go about it. Really. So me and my friend Lennon, we just kind of stood in my backyard and tried to figure out what was funny to us. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and I think I think Louis Anderson said to me keep writing after I did my, my, my first three minutes. He says, you got something. He says, keep writing. And then um, I didn't know how to shape it. 
And so Perry was was good in helping with that. And then Lennon was good with with helping me to, you know, write something down every day. And um, I just started getting on stage by trial and error and figuring out what worked. And then finally, I found uh, my comedic voice. You know, so now it's like it's easy for me to write for myself because I know what I sound like. Right. You know, what would you say that voice and style is? Um, I, I'm a storyteller. You know, so so um, in fact, recently I've never taken a, 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 a comedy writing class, but I've taken like a poetry writing class. And a friend of mine who I play football with, he um, taught this class and he gave me this technique that I use for comedy. He says, write down today's date, uh, write down the date you were born and then write down today's date and draw a line straight across. He says, then think about major events in your life through that time period, things that affected you negatively, draw a little hash mark going down, things that, things that affected you positively, draw a little hash mark growing up and put, you know, the approximate year or date, if you can remember that that happened. And so it spurs these ideas of your life. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it's like I've I've been taking stories out of my life and putting them on stage, you know, from when I was a kid all the way up until now. So things that happen, you know, sometimes that's the funniest stuff. And, and, um, you know, when you write, uh, I think about yourself, I think the audience sort of identifies with the universality of it that, you know, uh, you know, my cousin slipped in a shower or whatever, um, or I slipped in a shower and, you know, they, they, they understand what that is, but then they're glad that it's not them at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the comedy is. Yeah. Schadenfreude. That, that, yeah. kernel of truth, <laughs> that kernel of truth that makes them go, ooh, that could have been me. <laughs> right, right. It's like, my life is kind of jacked up, but it's not that. <laughs> so now you were saying earlier that stand-up sort of became like your, your day job, although not, you know, you should perform during the day. Um, how did you balance that? Because I know that a lot of times people, uh, get pigeonholed into like, this is your thing in Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. Um, how were you able to sort of navigate that as an actor to avoid being just the stand up guy? I, I don't, I don't know that I did until, uh, you know, I, I found the agents that understand that I'm a very talented actor. Um, uh, I, I was with a big agency in the eighties. And, um, when they saw me do stand up, they only sent me out for sitcoms mm-hmm. and they signed me. I was doing a very heavy dramatic play. I was playing a lead in, in, uh, life is a dream by called their own, which is this classical piece. And, you know, it's a very, very heavy piece. And, um, uh, they signed me based on me doing that play. And then, stop sending me out for dramas, which made no sense to me. (laughs) And then, so the agents I have now, they're like, they get it. They're like, you know, you are an actor, so let's go get you everything. And so I'm going to, I'm actually going to Canada Tuesday to do a drama. Awesome. The character is funny, (laughs) but it's a drama. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I was looking at your IMDb, you've done kind of a wide range. I saw that you were in a a horror film pretty recently and you were actually in it with a a really good friend of mine. Ah, who's that? So you did West of Hell and uh, Ben Adams was in that. And he played- Oh, with- uh, 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 Tony Todd. Tony Todd, Yeah. yes. Candyman, I I didn't look right in his eye the whole time I was on set. I was like, hey, hey, Tony, how you doing? (laughs) You can't, right? It's like you still have that ingrained in your head, like you're the Candyman, I can't look at you. I still won't say Candyman in in my mirror. I just won't do it. Terrified a generation. And he's a great guy, too, so. (laughs) How did you enjoy working on a a scary movie? Well, it it was very fast. I mean, I went in. In fact, my my, uh, manager, I think... uh, the director of that film was one of my manager's clients. And so um, he says, hey, uh, I have this thing that, that I think you'd be good in. And um, he says, it's really terrible money, but y- you know, you should, you should do it. And so I went in and you know, shot one day, I was in and out in one day. So, but it was fun. And I mean, it was great to be a, you know, in something with Tony Todd. <laughs> <laughs> well, Did you get to interact with him much on set? Yeah, yeah, my scene is with him. Oh, perfect. Yeah. You mentioned you'd been with a big, uh, agency mm-hmm. in the eighties. When did you make the switch to the kind of smaller agency? I don't know that I made the switch as as more as like the managers that I had at the time when it, when I left there. Um, the agency, the face of the agency, agency had changed. My um, 
the two uh, guys who own the agency, uh, they both passed. And then there were like these young sort of whippersnappers that were in there then. And I was just stagnant. It's like, you know, I'd been with them for several years and everybody who was really handling me had left after the old guys passed. And um, so my manager's like, we gotta get you out of there. So they put me with another company that, you know, lasted a year, but they had a really good relationship with them. So that's why they wanted me there. Right. And so they took me out of there because it, it was going under. And then, I, and then I had a year where I didn't have any representation. And um, a friend of mine was with the Sarah Bennett agency. And it's like this lady in her house, working out of her house. And uh, I signed with her. Really didn't get anything while I was with her. And um, one day I went to an audition for Terminator 2 and didn't hear anything for months. And I left her. And then a couple months later, I get a call from Wardrobe from Terminator 2. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, we need your sizes. I was like, for what? I, I couldn't even remember the audition at that point. And, and so that was sort of when things started changing. Once I did Terminator 2, um, I don't know, all of a sudden the snowball started happening. You know, one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. Um, but then I was still in the situation where my agent situation was bad. So one of the agents from the first agency that I was with was uh, at an age, she, she said, Mark, um, you should come over here. And so I went over there and <laughs> this, agent, this agent who ran that agent, who was the head of that agency was just verifiably crazy. <laughs> and I, I've had like producers tell me, I hate your agent. Um, the only reason you're here is because we love you, but I hate your agent. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was like, well, I, I guess he's doing his job, but <laughs> you know, um, but then he closed his doors and um, again, I was without an agent. So I talked to another person from that first agency and said, hey, uh, a friend was referring me to this, this other agency. What do you think? Because I knew one of them, her husband was there. And she says, oh, they're very good. She said, I think you're bigger than they are right now. She says, but it's pilot season and you don't have anybody. So you should sign. If they want to sign you, you should sign. Mm -hmm. And so I signed and within two weeks, I had two movies and, and two pilots. Wow. And was very happy and stayed too long. It's like I was there, um, you know, for many years and, and I probably should have left after that first contract was up, you know. Um, but but I, when I like people, I tend to, you know, just hug them close, you know, yeah. keep, keep them close. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always said that I've never had all the pieces in place at the same time. I've never had the right agent, the right manager, the right publicist all at the same time. And um, so then me and my managers right. were talking and we decided, you know, it's, it's time to move there. And so I made a clean break and went to the agency that I'm with now. And, you know, they're a much bigger agency. They have all these people that are working all the time. Right. Um, you know, um, they're not all stars, but they're all, you know, working actors. And I felt really comfortable. So I went in and had a good meeting and, and, and they get it. They get that, you know, you're an actor and you know, there's going to be ups and downs and we're not going to dump you if you're in a slump. And I've been in a slump, you know, since Chuck, it's like, it's been hard to transition to something else. You know, I've done some stuff since then, but it's been, it's been really difficult. Um, it's like, it's, it's like, um, I think the thing that people don't understand about this business is that, is that uh, you're in a project that's, that's a great project that a lot of people like. Um, and then all of a sudden that ends and you're looking for that next thing and it doesn't come. You know, you may book some stuff and it's not really the right vehicle yet. And so I think the stand up really helps because it keeps me sane. It's like, OK, um, I'm not working a lot as an actor right now, but as a stand up, I'm busy you know, and it keeps the creative thing going. And so I'm OK with it. And so. Um, the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. I think people don't understand that part of this business. They think that, you know, once you're a recognizable face, which is what I think I am, I'm not a name, I'm a recognizable face. Right. That, that you know, you, you must be fine. But it's, it's not. It's like there, there was an article this week, uh, this past week, um, there's, there's an actor, I can't remember his name right now, he used to be on the Cosby show. And he was working. Right, working. I, I saw that article, yeah. yeah. Is that crazy? It's like, people are stupid. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, 
that's a classic example. It's like, you got to do what you got to do to survive in the yeah. meantime. Yeah. Well, and I think what people who are not in the business fail to understand is it's like running your own small business. So you have exactly to go out that. there and get your clients, you know, get your gigs. Yeah. Um, You're a perpetual startup. That's what yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. Every time the job is over, you're looking for another one. And yeah. I, think, I think that's why it's... I, I was telling a friend of mine, I said, there's, there's, there's a depression that comes with this job because the highs are very high. And then when it's over, it's a very deep low. So a lot of people get depressed about it. Yeah. Um, and I think stand up helps me control that a little bit. You know, it's like, okay, I had a lot of fun working with those people. Now it's on to the next thing. So you're always looking for that next thing. Yeah. You know, it, it never stops. It's like, you know, here comes another job interview. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a constant flow of just job interview after job interview after job interview. Yeah. That's, that's really what auditions are. And, yeah. And me as a producer, you know, like begging people for money constantly. Right. Like, hey, help me make right. this. <laughs> you know? It's, right. It's very humbling. It, it is. This, this profession. It is. I, I think, I think um, one thing about, about, uh, the audition. Although I'm prepared every time I go to an audition, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm always right. prepared. I don't leave anything to chance. To chance. Right. It's like it's like uh, uh, the only thing I can control in the room is what I do in the room, and so um, I don't leave anything to chance. I go in, do the very best I can do, and hope for the best. You never know why you don't get a job. I had a producer, right. a commercial producer, tell me one time. He says. You know, the last job that we did together, he said, you almost didn't get because the girl that they like was taller than you, the woman who's going to be your, your wife. And he says, I had to keep telling them, he's the money. That's the guy. You can put him on an Apple box or something. <laughs> Nobody's got to see his feet. <laughs> right. right. And um, uh, he, he says, you know, he said, you never know why you don't get a job. He says, he said, you come in with a purple shirt on. And one of the producers hates purple wives left him last night with, with a purple dress and you're guilty by association. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to tell I try to tell the actors that I work with that all the time. It's like, don't yeah. don't take it personal. Yeah, you can't. You, you, you go just, crazy. You absolutely can't take it personal because it has nothing to do with you most of the time. Right. Yeah. Right. I, and, and, and me, it's like it's like I know. Um, when I go in the room, I know I'm doing very well. It's like, it's like, I, you know, I'm prepared. I'm good at it, mm -hmm. you know, and I know I'm good at it. So I go in and I do a good job. And if I don't get the job, I don't take it personal. It's like, you know, they, they weren't looking for me. They were looking for something else, you know? Yeah. So when you landed the part on Chuck, mm -hmm. um, they ended up what, five seasons? Yeah, five seasons. Did you? Technically four and a half. Four and a half. Because yeah. it was straight. Um, did you know that Big Mike was going to be no, such I, a big part of the show going? Through? I didn't read for Big Mike. You read for I read for Harry, Harry Tang, Tang, right? Big Mike was in the script. What a what a strange different role that would have been <laughs> if you played Harry Tang. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I really liked the Harry Tang role you know, because he was so mean. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I read, and here, here was a thing that that pilot season I was up for. I think four pilots, four other pilots that were series regular roles. Mm -hmm. The Harry Tang job wasn't. It was. It was just a guest star. Right. And so I didn't put any time into it, and you know I concentrated on the series regular stuff. And then when it was time to go do the the Chuck audition, I just said, okay, I'll do it the night before, get ready, and went in, did it, and left. And the other pilots kind of all faded away. A couple of them I went to, went to network on. It didn't happen. One of them was uh, car coolers. And I was sure I was getting that job. <laughs> and, and, and it didn't happen. Um, uh, and then I get this call. I'm getting ready to go to Hawaii. And I get a call. And um, they say, hey, uh, that, that thing Chuck you read for, they, they wrote a part that they think you'll be perfect for. And it's, they're just going to offer it to you. And um, it's uh, possibly recurring, so, but it's kind of high and by. And I sat. It's like, all right. And then, uh, so the first season, I did every episode. And every episode, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I said to my agent about halfway through, I said, hey, you got to tell him I'm not coming back for this month. Mm -hmm. I said, because this is not high and by. I said, and last night I did a stunt and <laughs> didn't get a stunt bump. I said, so clearly this is a job that's bigger than, than what it was sold to us as. I mm -hmm. said, so 
um, they'll get me some money. So he goes, he goes, well, um, you have to be prepared for them to write you out. I said, I'm prepared. I said, I've always told you, you know, I'm not afraid to lose a job over the money. Right. I said, because I don't have the money now. So <laughs> what's to lose? Right. There's nothing to lose. And so he goes, okay. So then we get a call that um, uh, casting had already been talked to them about. They had to lock down some of the people that were, you know, on the show. And um, so they sort of negotiated a deal for those last three episodes. And then that Friday, they cut a deal for me to be a series regular in the following season. So that's how Big Mike became a, a regular on the show. It was I'm, I'm, I've been binging for the third time Hilarious. series the last few days. I've, I was sick all last week, so I got yeah. into a binging mode. So I'm, I'm halfway through season three again. Um, but I was I was watching it, and actually that's how this interview came to be. Is I, I posted how excited I was that Chuck had showed up on Amazon Prime and yeah. I could watch it again. Um, and you responded. I was so over the moon that you responded to my post. Yeah, like when I, I was, I I was watching Big Mike <laughs> develop again. And, and remembering, like, it was so clear watching that first season again that the writers seemed to just be enjoying what was going on in the Buy More more and more. Yeah. <laughs> and really fleshing out what you guys were doing there. And I think a huge part of that was was your character, I think, just clicked. I think had they stayed with that instead of, like, bringing in, like, you because know, they, they brought in a lot of, like, big-name kind of guest stars. Mm -hmm. I think had they stuck with... You know, concentrating on on the people that were already in the buy more, and you know, I think that would have helped the show more. Yeah, um, focus on the story. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, because because like by season three, Big Mike was basically eating sandwiches. It's like I come to work and eat a sandwich, and that was my job that week. Right. And it, and it got boring. <laughs> So you said that when they first wrote this character, like they kind of wrote it with you in mind. Um, as the character developed, you feel like they pulled from your personality or how, what was the No, because, because Big Mike was very different from me. You know, especially the first couple of seasons, which I love that he was, he was this kind of a hard ass, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love that because it's, 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 it's a total polar opposite of, of who I am in, in real life. I'm very easy going, just, you know. And, um, but then when he went to the, to the uh, El Segundo School of... And he came back in all the suits. And he came back with the suits. He was suits. softer when he came back yeah, with the suits. Yeah, yeah, you know, he was, he was, he was, he was gentler. And, and, and I think, I think for me, that wasn't as much fun to play as the other way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even though it was good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting, because like, you know, I always wonder about that when, when somebody lands into a, a role that they continue to play for several years. Like, how how do you keep approaching the job as something fresh if it's something that you're having difficulty connecting to? Because I never, as a as a viewer watching it, I never got that you seemed bored. To your to your yeah. acting credit, never felt like oh, Mark looks like he's bored in this episode. You always. Yeah. Like you gave it everything. Well, I mean, you had. it's still my job. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I want to, I want to do my job well, so I go to work and I do it to the best of my ability, regardless of what Marcus for Lawrence thinks. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not what what Big Mike thinks. You know, Big Mike is doing his job, um, or getting other people to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but um, I, I think I think part of the problem with with. Uh, the show, I think, was NBC licensed the show from Warner Brothers, and, and uh, they never really wanted the show. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like every president, you know, at NBC, you know, we went, they went through three through pre, three presidents while we, while we were on the air. Yeah, it's tough. and none of them, you know, they, they would always wait to see if they if they were going to greenlight any of their pilots before they gave us a pickup. Yeah, you know, even though the fans were were saying, "Hey, keep the show on." Yeah, I remember and as would, a fan, I remember that. Like, right, constantly and, like, are they coming back? I don't know. And we would lose writers, mm -hmm. you know, because writers the writers had families, and they're like, you know, I got I got to take this other job. I can't wait. And yeah. So they, they took a job, and so by by the final season, I think there were only two writers that were from the there from the beginning, you know, and and it's unfortunate because I think the the team was solid that first yeah. year. It was a solid writing team, and. Um, you know, a couple of them that really loved the way they wrote. And, and it was there was one lady who I loved the way she wrote for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it was always funny. My funniest stuff those first couple of seasons was her. And it was great. Has anybody ever brought up the fact with you? And, and I'm, 
I'm completely going off of my interpretation from watching it for a third run, but there were more slow mo shots of Big Mike than anybody else in the series. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Especially those first few seasons. Every episode you were in, there was a slow mo you running at some Hilarious. point. Hilarious. <laughs> I, I should put it together a reel. <laughs> you a totally should. Reel. There are so many slow mo shots of Big Mike running. That's funny. <laughs> and, it, and it's almost every time you you had an episode you were in. It's probably because it was funnier <laughs> because because every time that I ran, you know, it's like in my head, I was still like in my football days. <laughs> so in my head, I was like moving. <laughs> probably bad. You ever, you ever see like a kid running on the beach out really slow, but he's got technique? Right. <laughs> Yeah, for me it was it, it, it's just it was really fun to kind of come to that realization the last few days because here's a here's a you know an action show right with all this spy stuff, but the great glory slow mo hero shots were like <laughs> almost all reserved for you. That's funny. <laughs> it was really incredible. That's funny. So you said going into that first season, you had some. Um, uh, some some stunts that you did. Did you do all of your stunts throughout yeah. the show? How how was that like? Well, um, the I, I think I put a, a quad Ooh. on 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 one of the first thing with Patrick Kilpatrick where I where I come running down the the aisle and I hit him. Yeah. You know, my first spy encounter. I um I think I pulled a quad that day. It's like <laughs> because I, I got to work and I stretched real good. And then I didn't, we didn't shoot it until late that night. The classic and hurry I, up and wait. I was in there asleep. And then I, was, I get this knock on the door. Hey, Mark, they're ready for you. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the heads up? Because <laughs> <laughs> I go over there and I think I just like pull, like a slight pull. But but it's funny because when we were shooting it, you know, we were at a distance. It's like I just kind of faked the hit. And then, um, so when the camera got in close, the, the stunt coordinator comes to me and goes, hey, hey, Mark, so we're going to put the stunt man in. And um, he says, you know, the camera's really close, so, you know, you're just gonna have to hit him. We wanna, we wanna really see that arm, you know, get into his chest. And so they had a pad over there for him to fall back on. And so I come running down the aisle, boom, knocked him off the pad, all the way off. <laughs> and he, he hits the crowd and then he just starts laughing. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. He goes, no, that was great. <laughs> All the way off the pad, it was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Some guys appreciate a good hit, yeah. right? right. <laughs> and Patrick was like, "Man, I'm glad that wasn't me." <laughs> so, you've guest starred on a lot of TV series over yeah. the years. Yeah. What, what um, what's it like as a as an actor to step foot into a into a single episode kind of situation like that on a, on established shows? It's it's different every time. I mean, you never know what's going on. Like like years ago. Like I've been on stuff that that's pre IMDb, so mm -hmm. there's there's stuff that that that's you don't even know that I've done, right? You know right. because IMDb, but there was no internet. <laughs> that's how old I am. And um, um, but every time it's different. Like like one time I, I worked on designing women, and um, it was in the midst of their turmoil. You know the ladies were having these big fights, Dixie Carter and and uh, I forget the other gal's name. And I get to work and it's you do the table read and then they just go, go their separate ways. <laughs> and me and Meshach Taylor are sitting there and I go, it's just thick. I said, Meshach, how do you work like this? He goes, I just try to stay out of their way. <laughs> <laughs> was like, man, that was like one of those jobs where you go, okay, let me just do my job and get my money and go. And um, uh, so every time it's different. And then sometimes it's like you go to a set and they just treat you like you're one of them, like you've been there all along and that's that's fun um you know sometimes you don't even see everybody sometimes you go in and you do your scene and you're out or right you know so it's different it's a different way to work i think you know from from when you're a series regular and you're working on a show and you have that um that sort of camaraderie with with your castmates mm -hmm. and it's, it's a little different because because you know people have their thing you know what i mean like my very first job was hill street blues and um uh I was going to USC at the time and I rode my bike to set and, you know, I get there and Daniel J. Trevanti takes me around and is like, introduce me to everybody. 
and it was so nice of him to do that. He's like, and he's telling me, yeah, this is Mark. He's, this is his first job. It's like, that's awesome. Aww. And he was, it was really cool. And, um, and, and then he introduced me to one person I won't, who will remain nameless, who, who was like, you know, I don't have time for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I never forgot. And I was like, and then, so we, we've actually read for the same role a couple of times. I was like, I hope you got time for this. <laughs> 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 and both times that, that we read for the same role, I got the job. I was so happy. <laughs> I wonder if that person remembers that because he probably doesn't. He but, probably but doesn't. But you do. Like, it stands I, I'll out never in your forget it because it was he, 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 born here. Here's today's date: positive, negative. Yep. Mm-hmm. It was you remember the people who impact your life positively and negatively. Right. The people who just sort of filter through without leaving an impact that you don't remember those people. Yeah, I took uh, I took theater at Baylor. And uh, I remember the first day I was I was in the program. They sat the whole theater department in the in the thrust uh, theater so mm-hmm. we could all see each other. Oh wow! And the the head of the department says, "Take a look around at all these faces here. Know that you're going to be looking at all these faces every day for the next four years. And remember that every interaction you have here could potentially affect you professionally." at any time down the road, this is a small business. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, so if you got a problem with somebody, just keep it to yourself or, <laughs> or figure out how to work it out, you know, amicably. Yeah. But don't make enemies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, I, like, he's like, just be aware. He's well, it's like, funny. It's like, even from that experience, it's like uh, years later, uh, I was producing a play at the Los Angeles Theater Center uh, with some producing friends of mine. And, and, um, that character came in, that guy came in to read for the play. And I'd already had the conversation with these guys, you know, because we're, we're, you know, we're really close friends. Mm-hmm. And uh, as soon as he walked in, they both of them looked at me like, <laughs> 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 and as soon as he walked out, one of them took his resume away. <laughs> oh. I was like, but he wasn't right for the part. So, I mean, had he been right, we would have hired him. But. Do you feel like that experience has changed how how you treat people? Like whenever you were a series regular, like your guest stars and things like that, were you? No, you know what, you know what changed the, the way I treat people? It was my very first job on Hill Street Blues. Um, we worked downtown at Six and Crocker. And uh, most of the extras, um, the way they had them dressed and stuff looked like they were homeless and there were a lot of homeless people around and i noticed the way some of the pas were treating the extras hmm. and it changed my approach to the business first thing i said was okay i'm not going to do extra work uh because they treat them terribly right i said and then um i'm just going to treat everybody nice because you never know who's going to be doing what Right. Classic example, I, I did a radio drama at USC when I was at, at USC. It was called University of the Damned. And um, the guy who produced and directed that radio drama um, ended up cutting the trailers for Terminator 2, you know, years later. And then and then I've run into him several times since then on other projects. And so you never know who is going to do what. Right. You know. So I'm just nice to folks. Just be nice. It's a good policy. Well, plus yeah. I live in San Diego, you know, and, and, and I, I'm nice to everybody. Cause like here in San Diego, we, there's, we have a, the, one of the largest, uh, I don't know what you would call it, like concentration of, of military in, in, in the world yeah. here in San Diego. And, you know, there's Navy SEALs here, there's Green Berets, there's, you know, all these special forces kind of guys. I'm nice to everybody because you don't know who's who, who is capable of what. <laughs> <laughs> True point. How long have you lived in San Diego? I've been here uh, since '99. Right? Yeah. Do you find it um, a challenge to continue working as a as a working actor living here? No, because because um, I'm, I'm not I'm not that, at, that, at that point in my career where I jump through all the hoops. Mm-hmm. See, um, like when you first start, you go to the casting director's assistant and then, you know, they either pass you on to the casting director. So you come back for another audition and then the casting director will bring you back in for the director. And then they bring you back in for the producer. I go straight to producer every time. Right. So I'm either going to get a job or I don't. Right. So, so there's a lot of, a lot of actors. Uh, you, you've been to San Diego Film Week and the Film Awards mm-hmm. here. And, um, and we greatly appreciate 
all your support with what we what we've been doing. I'm a I'm a board member at Film oh, Consortium, cool. um, and, and there, there's a constant struggle for you know the folks acting here in town, yeah, about whether they should be moving to LA or if they can make it by while staying here, and, and it's a personal decision on every yeah, every point. Absolutely, um, but, you, but you think early if, if you got all those hoops to jump through, you might as well be closer. Yeah. You know, but, but I'm at a point where, you know, it's going to be one audition. I'm going to either get it or not. So I'll drive up once or take the train up once. I, you know, I normally leave a car at the train station, take the train back and forth. And it's easy. Yeah. I'm in that hoop stage. I log a lot of miles between here and Los <laughs> Angeles. Well, and you're also teaching at College of the Desert. So. Yes, I make a lovely triangle. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we gotta do what we gotta do, right? I have a Prius, yeah. so. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's um, you. <laughs> how much of your of your acting experience uh, gets pulled into your stand-up? You know, I, I have a friend, Eugene, that told me years ago that I should do more characters in my stand-up. Um, and and I never really thought of myself as doing characters, but but like even last night, I was on stage twice last night, twice the night before, once the night before, and I found myself that that I do what what comics call act outs. So it's like you have a bit, like I have a bit where where I, I say um, uh, I was sweating butter, and people weren't even trying to help me; they was walking up, dabbing their biscuits on my forehead. And then in that moment, one night, you know, probably two years ago. This is the Missouri joke, right? Yeah. And so in that moment, you know, like two years ago, that emotion became a guy. Yeah. Hey, bring grandma. You know, it's like, <laughs> and so, so I don't even consciously think, you know, here's a character. I just, it just comes out. I'm going to need to hear this Missouri joke later. I'm from Missouri. So, <laughs> so it's, it's posted on Facebook. <laughs> She's not one of the fluffy women you were talking about. Uh, no, no, certainly not fluffy. <laughs> and fluffy's not a bad thing. <laughs> so um, I was just wondering, in, in all of your time of acting and, and performing on stage, what has been your favorite role and your most challenging role? And are they the same or are they different? <laughs> Uh, definitely different. Um, well, I don't know. I, that might be. I, I, th I think. I think my favorite role was my my most challenging role. It was on stage, and it was uh, an August Wilson play, uh, a piano lesson. I played Boy Willie, and um, uh, it was so much fun to play a character that had that great big zeal for life, and. Um, knew exactly what he wanted. He knew what he wanted to do. He's, he's, he's like, he said several times throughout the play, look, I, I've saved one third of this money to go buy some land. He says, I got that truck out there full of watermelons. He says, he said, I'm gonna sell that to get the second third. And then we're gonna sell that piano and I'm gonna get the third third. And his sister was like, you can't sell that piano because it, it's our history, it, it means too much. And, but he didn't care, he's gonna sell that piano. And it ends up having a fight with the ghost. <laughs> and so uh, that role uh, was probably probably my favorite role to do. Um, but it was so challenging because he talked so much. It's like the play, I think it's probably 108, maybe 128, something like that pages. And he has the lion's share over on, you know, like 86 pages. Mm -hmm. There's there's one there's one section where it's literally a ten page monologue that gets interrupted by a line, a line, and so I just treated it as a monologue, and I was like, "You guys jump in where you fit in, because I'm just gonna <laughs> ignore it and keep going. going. <laughs> if you the train fall, ain't stopping if you at the falls, station. I'm, I'm moving along, and so uh, just memorizing that thing was incredibly difficult, and so um, in fact, I broke my back. Um, while I was working on that play, I slipped in the shower and broke my back. Oh my god! Um, I crushed my T11, but 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 you know it's not a big deal. Because I don't, you know, I just kept doing the play. <laughs> but memorizing, it's like you know, through the pain of it, it was hard to memorize because they gave me like oxy and I couldn't function on it, and, and so um, so I just had to deal with it. Um, 
but every day it's like it's the, the last thing I did before I went to bed. First thing I did when I got up in the morning was hit those lines. My friend Lawrence would come over and we'd run lines together. And um, and still like going into previews, I'm holding 20 pages because there's so much. It's like it's so. And so me and the director, we had a talk, and she goes, she goes, yeah, it's a lot of work. She says you're a lead actor, Mark. She says it's. it's she says she says um, put on your big boy panties and <laughs> do what you got to do. And then um, she says, but don't worry. She says I'm not worried. She says I don't care if you if you hold pages right up until opening night. She says she says, she says you'll be fine. And then um, uh, I think our second dress rehearsal, I said to the stage manager, I said, hey, I'm going to put the pages down tonight, so I'm going to need you to be on book and be ready. And she was like, okay. And the first time that I called a line, she wasn't paying attention. <laughs> and then I went, thanks a lot. And, just, and then it hit me and I kept going. <laughs> and, then, um, and then the night before opening it all clicked and it just and it's like ah it's there and then i was on a roll and the play was just moving it's like yeah. with august wilson if you just say the words you're you are you know halfway there right you know just say the words and because he the, the the writing is so beautiful that that it just it sings you know he, he calls it a, a a blues pentameter and um it, and it, it is it has a rhythm to it and if you just say it the way he wrote it you know, and I think that's probably part of the problem is that I'm, I'm a stickler for saying the words that the writers wrote and make them work. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas some people, you know, they'll they'll get the writer's words and then they'll try to, you know, make it fit them. It's like, you know, no, you say the words and make and make that work. And that's the way I, that's the way I was taught. So that's the way I work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's because you came out through theater. I think that's theater. a very theater mentality. The yeah. idea it was written this way for a reason. Yeah, and there is a, a musicality to yeah. what what was written. Well, with TV, like sometimes it's like like if like if it's a joke if or something, and I and I think there's a better way to do it. I'll I'll do it their way, and then I'll go to the director and say, Hey, what if I said it like this, or what if I said this instead? You know, I'll, I'll pitch options that I think are funnier. And usually they'll go, yeah, let's let's get one that the writer the way the writers did, and then let's and then let's do your way. Well, I think it's a difference too between television and, and stage. Oh yeah, because most of the writers on stage, I mean, they'll labor over their, their oh, script. Absolutely, for years absolutely. There's so, there's so much you ever depth. Get in, to the stage. There's so much depth in stage that 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 that's not in film and TV. Yeah, because TV know, scripts are written in like a week. It, it's 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 formula. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it, this is the formula for it. Um, but but most of the time when I when I pitch an idea, you know, my idea ends up in the in the final. Which you know, like on Chuck, I think I think um, there was only once that I pitched an idea and it didn't get in. It's <laughs> pretty good track record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you must be funny. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, so okay, in regards to like your technique as far as memorizing, yeah, was it just pure repetition on that, or do you have different techniques for film versus theater? No, um, I, I do it the same way every time. I, I highlight everything um, because I see the page in my head, um, and, and that came from when I was doing you function like I do. That's... When I was doing speech, you know, I, I, I generally Mrs. Schilling would give me things to do like, like I would do oral, inter oral interpretation of literature where I'm doing a bunch of characters and so I put each character in a different color Ooh. and so uh, when I'm practicing it uh, the color represented a character which represented a voice and um, automatically I see the color and then my head would put the right voice where it is mm -hmm. and so um, and I started noticing that as I work that way I could see I literally see the page so now I have to highlight everything so I just highlight my whole part even though I, I know I'm just gonna say all these words but I highlight them anyway because then I see it but then sometimes after I highlight it and I read it a couple of times it's in there yeah and then sometimes it's not sometimes it's like you gotta go over it and over it and over it and over it TV it gets in there pretty fast mm -hmm. um, uh, film a little is a little more in depth, so sometimes it doesn't. And then if it's a character that doesn't really, um, I don't know, talk the way you talk, the vernacular is different. Then sometimes that's a little more difficult. Like like Shakespeare, usually the first couple of weeks, if I'm doing a Shakespeare play, it's so hard to get those words into my head because we don't talk like that all the time. Right. You know. Um, but then after a couple of weeks of doing it, then all of a sudden it's like, it, okay, here it is. Mm -hmm. I love hearing how prepared 
you are with your with your approach to the work. Yeah. Um, as an actor who comes in with you know definitive choices made and, and prepped with your lines and really knowing what you want to do, what's your relationship with a director? Like, what are you looking for from a director um, as an actor? I mean, hopefully, as an actor, you, you have a director that has a vision that he sees. Uh, you know, this is the way this thing is going to move and this is what helps me. And then you bring what you bring and then he goes, OK, that fits in here or, or that doesn't fit. Or, and, and so hopefully the director will give you some notes that will help you help guide you into his vision. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time I don't get notes other than Probably Mark, because you're so prepared. Mark, can you move over here? Or can you go over there? <laughs> and, and, it, it, and it's like even even like, you know, I remember I was doing Anthony and Cleopatra. That was my first uh, Actors Equity play. And um, I remember I was never, I had a small part. I played Diomedes and I understudied Alexis and it actually went on as Alexis, but I, I would never get notes. And so it, it was like driving me crazy because, you know, I mean, I had enough, it was a big enough part where I probably should get some notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, uh, Sir Anthony Richardson, Sir Tony Richardson was directing the play. And um, so one day, like we, I think we're in, previews were, were just about to open and John Goodman was in the play and uh, Kyle Sikor, CCH Pounder, Rosalind Cash, Mitchell Ryan. And so one day after everybody left, I just sat there. He goes, what? I said, you can give me any notes. I said, you never give me any notes. And he goes, no, that's because you have great instincts. He says, follow your instincts. He says, he says here's one note that I'm gonna give you. Um, Cause I was still in college at the time. He goes, Sometimes I see your technique. He says, uh, let that go. He says, school is jacking you up. Let that go. He says, um, but follow your instincts. He says, you have strong instincts. You make strong choices. He says, trust me, if you sucked, I'd tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something I've told some actors. Yeah. <laughs> but most of the time, it's like most of the time I don't get, I don't get notes. And, it's, and, 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 and you know, and, and the insecure actor always goes, like, there's got to be something there. There's got to be, there's help. more. <laughs> you know. Um, in regards to technique, so I, ever since you mentioned this, I'm like, you, you said that you broke your back. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, what do you do physically to, one, obviously if you have an injury, there might be some tension. How do you, um, how do you prepare your body for becoming different characters? Well, it depends on what it is. You know, most of the time I'm the fat guy. So, <laughs> so that's easy. I, you know, I eat. <laughs> um, it, just, it just depends on what it is. I, you know, I, I try to work out and try to, you know, stay focused on, on, on not getting myself hurt. You know, so, um, you know, I try to be limber, try to, you know, just my everyday regular routine, unless it's something that, that I know I'm going to be running or, or something like that in it, then I got to actually go and do some running or whatever. Um, I mean, so what is your routine though? Do you just get up and stretch? Do you do yoga? No, I go to the gym. I, you know, I do cardio. I do a little bit of weights, not, not a lot, just, you know, a lot of, rep, a lot of reps. Um, uh, right now I'm, I'm really sort of in a position where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, sort of because I'm getting older, I think I'm transitioning into uh, in my head to to get rid of some of the weight that I'm carrying. You know, so so now I'm focused on on that. I'm getting a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you worry because we do get pigeonholed in this business mm -hmm. a lot? Do you worry that if you shed some of those pounds you might lose out on some jobs no i i um it's, it's funny because because i i noticed that that when I, I used to do a lot of commercials and when i was thinner i did more commercials but when i'm heavier i i, I used to do like more tv and film stuff mm -hmm. um but now that i'm 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 at an age where uh some of the stuff that i'm doing are going up for um, doesn't really matter mm -hmm. where I am weight wise, but I think uh, the problem that I'm having right now, and I, which I think is a cause of my slump, is that I don't look my age. 
Mm. And so I no, go. You look very young. So I go in, and 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 the guys that are the age range, you know, look the age range, and I look like I'm out of place. But then you put me in with guys that are, you know, the next generation down, um, and if they're not in the room with me, it's like, okay, this works. I can do this and, and be that age range. But if, if there's a bunch of us in the room together, it's like, oh, clearly he's the oldest one. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, it's again, some of that stuff that you really have no control over. Nothing that you have no control over. And, yeah. and, and, and I think, you know, for me, I think that's probably why I'm kind of letting this grow in a little bit. And, and so you can see the gray. Yeah. And, and when I go in, it's like, you know, okay, he, he's in his fifties, but, but every time I say it on stage, I, that I just turned 54 and people go, what? <laughs> this lady, this, I was in Portland. This lady comes to me after the show. She goes, you are not 54. She's like, you're in your forties. What are you talking about? And, and, and I'm like, I think I know how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like Sam Jackson in your seventies and looking like you're in right. your forties. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Sam is amazing. I mean, that's Blessing not a bad a thing, right? Look no, up. no. Especially for an actor. Right. <laughs> so one one final question. Yeah. Um, is there a dream type of role that you haven't had the chance to play yet? And, and, and going forward, it's a two-part question. Going forward, um, what would you like your career to to be? Are you looking for more series regular type work? Are you looking to continue being a film guy? Like, okay, so the first part of the question was, uh, what is the dream role? I, I don't know that I really have a dream role, but I know that there's there's a role that I haven't played that I know I can play and kill. Um, and it's a dark character. I haven't played anything that's really dark that you look at it and you go, oh my God, that guy is so scary. And, and because I have this face, you know, it's like, I remember, I remember back in, when I first started coming up, I was in my twenties and all the gangbanger movies were out. And um, I remember going in reading for one and Warner Brothers and they had me stay. They said, don't leave Mark. And so I go and sit and everybody else is going in and reading. They read everybody. And then the producers and the cast director came out and she gives me a hug and she says, okay, she says, um, here's the thing, we're not going to give you the job. She says, but we wanted you to know that you outread everybody. We thought that you were the best person that read for this part, but we wanted somebody that was just had a harder edge to me. We just want to hug you. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, well, they have this thing called makeup. And it started, it started, laughing. It started laughing. And I mean, I got it. I mean, I understood it. It's like, you know, they, they, they felt like, you know, that they wanted somebody that as soon as they saw him that they, you know, afraid of. But, but, you know, I mean, I've had this face all my life. This is my face. And I said to them, I said, I said, well, here's the thing. I said, I know a guy that grew up in my neighborhood who uh, right now is, is one of America's most wanted. And he and I look like brothers. We have the same sort of facial structure. He looks like this friendliest guy you ever you ever want to meet. I said, but he is the scariest guy, believe me, that you ever want to see. If you see him coming, you want to go the other way. I said, I said, you don't it, it, you you don't have to look scary to be scary. Mm. Classic example was uh, John uh, Lithgow had uh, I think it was like a six or eight episode arc on Dexter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first time you see him, he's so nice. He comes in, he's got this lady's dog, you know, your dog got away, it turns out he stole the dog. Next time you see the lady, she's dead in her tub. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so- It's terrifying. Holy mackerel. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a role that makes your skin Oh, you're getting Rob. goosebumps just yeah. talking about it. Yeah, Robin Honestly, Williams in photo booth. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, or one hour photo. Yeah. If you think about it in reality, successful serial killers have never looked creepy. They've no. always been very congenial. Right, so. and they're quiet. Yeah. <laughs> he was so quiet. He was nice and quiet. It's the quiet ones you got to watch out for. Right, right. So I totally think you could play a yeah. scary serial killer. I think that'd be great. <laughs> well, it's like... I, 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 one of uh, my friends and I, you know, we had this idea for this this character that I could play because he it, it, a true life thing, a biopic about a guy. Uh, I think they called him the uh, the L.A. creeper or sleeper or something the like that. The sleeper. I saw a documentary on that guy. And 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 but somebody beat us to the punch and, and, and did the did the movie already. It's been done. 
But um, as I as I looked at it, he was the nicest guy to people in the neighborhood. Like he mm-hmm. built a car from scratch for this girl who needed a car. And, and he and his wife lived in separate houses because she knew something was going on. And it was just really uh, a creepy guy. And I was like, I was like, I think this would be a great character because he's so nice. And then, but it, but there's that turn, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and and so that's what I'm, I, I'd like to play so, sort of something like that. Like right now, I'm working on um, a one man show. Me and Chris Clobber are writing it, and it's it's all characters wrapped in stand up. And I'll probably maybe tap in it a little bit and sing in it a little bit. Um, Chris, it was Chris's idea. He came to me one night. He says, "Hey, um, you know, every time I see you do stand up, I think, wow." Uh, Mark is really good in the stand-up thing. He says, and then he says, then I see you act. He says, I've seen you in a play, and it's like just blown away. He says, he says, usually, you know, there are actors who try to do stand-up that aren't very good at stand-up. He says, and there's stand-ups that try to act and aren't very good at acting. He says, but you're good at both. He says, and I have this idea. What do you think? And so we start talking about you know this piece. And so right now there's ten characters, um, but I only want to be on stage for ninety minutes. So. I said, we got to cut it down or, or we can just write all 10 characters and put them in and out based on where we are, mm-hmm. you know? And so we're in the process of writing that right now. And I think we're, we're down to the last three characters that we're going to write. Um, problem is like, it's like, uh, I'll, I'll be driving along and, and something will hit me. And it's like, that's a great character. Then I'll call him. And now we got another <laughs> character. <laughs> oh, the dangers of inspiration. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, so like one of the characters is is um you know the whole piece is, is sort of wrapped around you know uh, people that we love to hate you know and um one of the characters is the guy in the bible who we call him saul and he is the guy who put mary and joseph in the stable mm-hmm. you know when they were looking for a, a, a room and he goes what do you want how how was i to know <laughs> They come in the middle of the night. She's eight months pregnant on a donkey. <laughs> and now the jokes, the people, they, they think that I'm some kind of an evil guy. I get to heaven, St. Peter's at the gate and go, oh, it's you. Maybe we have a room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, so just in and out of characters and wrapping it in stand up and that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I think my only—it's like I've always said—I always say I don't have regrets, but but I, I, because I started working in Hollywood in college, and then my first job out of college, I went to San Francisco and did a, did a show with the San Francisco Mime Troupe. I, I didn't—I never went to New York, mm-hmm. and so my idea was I—I I really kind of hate that I didn't take a, a shot at Broadway, and so this I think is going to be my shot. I think I think we're writing this to get me to Broadway. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. So if you're out there and you got money, let's go to Broadway. <laughs> there it is again. The the, 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 hum, the humble nature of this profession, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you're out there, uh, I'm letting you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking, looking for, for investors. investors. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, thank you so much for, for oh, sitting down you. with thanks, us. Thanks it's, for having me. Yeah, huge this is a honor. great interview. <laughs> Yeah, and I could talk to you for many more hours. I know, but I know you got to get a well. Get anytime, a yeah, I get it. I, here's the thing: like, you know, people always talk about you know what, what's your your ritual, your pre-show ritual. It's like, and my thing is, I always got to get a nap because if I'm doing 45 minutes, like, you know, and, and like I haven't slept for the past couple of nights because I've been working on my my tax prep for my corporate stuff, and um, so, so I'm up all night, you know, crunching numbers and. Um, if I don't get a nap like halfway through the show, I feel a just a little slow. a little low. Yeah. yeah, and like last night, second show, about halfway through, I was like, "Ooh, I should have got a nap today," <laughs> but I couldn't because I had to keep pushing. <laughs> it's like it's like any athlete, right? Like you yeah, gotta conserve the energy for for the big game. You, you gotta you gotta you, you and that's exactly the way I approach it yeah. because I sweat a lot when I'm doing stand up. I sweat so it's, it's as if I'm on the on the football field. Yeah. <laughs> Like last night, it was so hot at the Madhouse. I was at the Madhouse. It was so hot, and um, you know, the Madhouse is in Horton Plaza, and you know, it's 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 a mall that's dying, and um, just got sold, right? Yeah, it just got sold, but it's just it's dead. It's like you walk around there, there's nobody walking around that mall, right? And um, uh, Robert, who owns the Madhouse, you know, he's up at the top, up there where where uh, Nordstrom used to be, right? Mm-hmm. And it's you walk through there, it's like there's nobody in this mall. And he says that you know the, the building owners 
are not upkeeping anything. And so the air conditioning is not working. <laughs> and so you're on stage, you got these rotisserie lights on you. <laughs> and literally like five minutes into my act, I am sweating like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and I said to the audience, as I said, you guys hot? They're like, yeah, it's hot. It's hot. <laughs> and, and I had like a hanky, a big hanky that I carry and I wiped. And then I wipe again. It's like I'm, I am pouring sweat. This lady out front is cracking. Every time I grab the hanky, she's cracking up because now the hanky is soaked. I'm drenched. My shirt is soaked all the way through. I usually wear like an undershirt underneath, and mm -hmm. so that you don't see sweat come through. And it's soaked all the way through. And this lady is dying. I said, "Why are you laughing so hard?" She goes, "She goes. It's like you're working out." <laughs> <laughs> and so what it's like, I wore a three-piece suit for a, oh. a play it, it, oh. when I was a Baylor. Uh, Texas. Yeah. Right? Hot as can be. Right. Humid as can be. Yeah. I sweat all the way through my three-piece suit on stage. The whole jacket was just, just dark soaked. and soaked at the end of the show. It's hilarious. <laughs> but Actors are athletes. We gotta do what we gotta do, right? Yeah. yeah. Truly. Yeah. I, in fact, in fact the, uh, I did the show Thursday night and then and then Friday night I did two shows and I get home I had sweat so much it's like I was cramping it's like my hand was like you know you ever get that cramp where this little muscle right here gets really yeah right and it's like oh man so then I, I did the the mustard trick you know you take like a teaspoon of mustard and, and put it under your tongue and it goes away really I never heard yeah. that <laughs> me neither yeah, something to try. <laughs> Apparently, it was an old wives' tale, and she knew what she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, thanks, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that plots in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush, no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck, telling you, please talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears.